God. I think so. Right, yeah, so uh, oh, yeah. I guess I've been at least temporarily avoided the chair here, so this committee. Um, maybe when we get more to the public portions, uh, my skill set will come into play. But in the meantime, I think probably uh, Jeff and Emily will run most of our meetings. But I guess because a few of us missed the last meeting, I'll just introduce myself. Um, Joe McCoy, uh, been East Hampton for about 20 years now and I've been on city council for quite a few years and served as a president for a few terms, um, full-time veterinarian and part-time goat farmer, uh, but uh, very interested in city and uh, like to be involved in what's going on in this great community. Yeah. So with that, I think Pat, you missed the last meeting too. So you want to give us a little update? Sure. I'm uh, Pat Ruff. I have been living here in the community for 24 years, actually. And I only know that because my anniversary is next week and it's the 24th. So <laughs> uh, uh, I work uh, at Fink and Paris Insurance Agency here in town. My wife's the owner of that, that business. And I have worked at on several different committees over the years. Uh, I helped with the Charter Review Committee, actually with Chris and Joe. Uh, I uh, currently am on the School Building Committee and I serve on the Council on Aging as well. So and very as same with joe and i think everybody else here uh very interested in in our community and and hoping and helping it move forward so thank you great i guess tracy's not here so jeff and emily why don't you guys take it away yeah and maybe before, before that real quick michael owens is on the call michael are you still there do you want to um hey, say hello uh, real quick uh, hey how are, how are you folks michael owens procurement officer i'll be working with jeff and emily to prepare the rfp and and uh, get moving on this over the next uh, year and a half or so. Perfect. Glad Thank to, you. Glad to see you all. Thanks. Let me get my video going here. Here we go. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I guess maybe, you know, with that, you know, this is our second meeting of this group. Um, you know, the first meeting was really an introductory in nature. And I think Joe and Pat, you know, both, will have or will have watched the meeting just for some context. Um, it was really just an introduction. And then, you know, Emily, through Emily's work with us, um, two, two um, memos were provided to the group. One is about the disposition process and kind of the approximate timeline that we have kind of now that we're working off of. And then, you know, Emily's work on um, pulling together other examples, um, you know, of, municipalities who have done similar things and so those will kind of be kind of anchor documents for us to be going back to and then kind of building off of as we move forward um you know what we're what we set out to do today and, and i'll hand it over to emily is to kind of take a look back at what um, was identified in in 2019 2020 so at that point there was a sounding board a uh, group kind of similar to this um, that worked through the downtown strategic plan. And, you know, a key component of that was the school reuse stuff. So um, they established some criteria. And I think Emily, you know, I think appropriately wanted to kind of just go back and revisit them. Now it's 2021, we had a pandemic and see what may have changed. Um, then from there, you know, we, we kind of are using these building blocks. We're going kind of slow and deliberately at first. Um, and then at the next meeting, we'll we'll kind of continue that discussion of the criteria in certain ways. And I think Emily will explain that. Um, at the end, uh, at the tail end, we'll talk about the next meeting date and just kind of go through that. And um, I can give a couple updates um, on a couple of the other projects that are kind of running parallel. Um, but we can do that a little bit later. So I think um, maybe Emily, if you want to take it away, have it, you know, a fun kind of way for us to interact with what we did two years ago. Thanks, Jeff. So first of all, good to see you all again. Uh, Pat, to meet you, and, and Joe, to see you again. Um, so Jeff laid it out pretty well. We've got three meetings to come up with uh, an important component of the draft RFP, uh, and that's going to be twofold. One is going to be the criteria that we use for evaluation, um, who's better than the other in terms of the, the goals of, of what the community is looking for. And the other is what are the things that are going to be required? What will every developer have to do? So to get us 
thinking about this and to, as, as Jeff pointed out, kind of deliberately make our way to those components. We're going to kick off today with the set of criteria that were in the downtown strategic plan. So we gave you homework last time. This is actually your quiz. <laughs> Um, and we're going to go through those and I'll show you how we'll do it. We're going to rank them on a scale. And I anticipate that as we get into the depths of what those criteria are, it should actually be quite a vibrant discussion. I don't think it's necessarily going to be easy to rank them. Then at our next meeting, we're going to talk about how we divide those into evaluation criteria. Um, so whether something is, that a developer, uh, potential developer proposes is less advantageous, advantageous or highly advantageous. So some of what we talk about today will feed into that. And then some of what we'll talk about today will feed into the, we asked that the developer, they must do this, or maybe there's a menu of options where we'll take two out of three or three out of five or something like that. But to get to that stage, we need to be able to, to sort of rank in our heads what was done before. And as, as Jeff mentioned, you know, maybe there's some changes. We've, we've collectively gone through a lot over the last year and a half. Um, and some of that may change some of our thinking. And then finally, at the December meeting, the idea is after we divide things into criteria versus evaluation um, or rec requirements versus criteria evaluation, the next step is going to be to actually put that into a draft to see what that looks like in written form. And so in December, we're going to discuss that. By doing it this way, A, we get really comfortable with what these concepts are and how they work and how they work within the context of an RFP and then the, the proposed development after that. But B, there are other things, as, as Jeff mentioned at our last meeting, there are other pieces coming along that will go into the draft RFP. So that gives us a chance to have those pieces moving in the background and in January or so pulling all of the pieces together and then at that point you get to look at that so it's not like in December you're going to look at the draft and all decisions will be made there'll be another chance for you to be thinking about it but it, it gives us the steps to the process so any questions on that before I show you our interactive piece can you repeat all that please yeah absolutely <laughs> so from the top <laughs> So I'll remind you too as we go through each step. So with that, I am going to share my screen. Um, let's see. So this is called a Moreau board, although I've heard it pronounced like three different ways at this point. Um, and you can't read it at all. So I'm, I'm going to just use that to, hang on, let me get rid of that out of the way, um, uh, sort of show you where we are. So we've got two components. One is frame one, which I'm going to zoom in in a minute. That's our actual sort of uh, shorthand for the criteria that was in the downtown strategic plan. Um, and that's the sliding scale that we're going to use. On the right-hand side in frame two is the actual details, because I don't expect you to all have the downtown plan in front of you. So if we get to a wait, what did the shorthand mean? We can just jump over to this side. Having said that, we're going to zoom in. So you can see it's broken down into community benefits, financial considerations, architectural design, circulation, access, and parking, compatibility, sustainable development, and then building uses. And we'll start just up here so I can explain a little bit more. So community benefits, there were, um, let's see, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight components of community benefits in the original criteria. Um, and those who are, are looking at home um, or maybe looking at, at a recording of this, they start on page 57. Mm -hmm. um, and the details of each of this. So when we talk about intergenerational use, we mean a development that provides direct civic benefit through its function or activities for East Hampton residents of all ages. So each of those shorthands has this larger piece over here that we can refer to. And all we're going, it sounds so simple, all we're going to do today is start moving on this line, what we think is more important and what we think might be 
less important. And so we start to shift these criteria. So there's no absolute value. We're looking at these in terms of relative value. Now, you probably saw that there were some blank um, uh, stickies over to the left here. Uh, that's if something comes up that, you know, maybe is an additional detail. Um, uh, Jeff and I were talking, for example, about the sustainability components earlier, where one of the criteria was lead certification. Well, lead certification is quite a hard, high barrier. So that may be something where do we want lead certification? Do we want it to be eligible for certification, but not necessarily require that it be certified? Any nuances like this, I'm just going to type directly into the sticky note so we have it as a, a record for our next conversation. I will warn you right now that I am one of the world's worst typists, so I'll correct any spelling uh, typos uh, after the meeting. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be here all day saying, no, wait, I before E except after. So... Any questions with that on what we're going to do? I do, Emily. Are these already ranked based on the community's um, ranking? They are in the um, uh, the document itself. There was a ranking score in there. I've deliberately left those off for the moment just so that we can have this conversation. And But if we need to go back and look and see how they were ranked, um, uh, this work would have been done in 2019. So, you know, we always have the original community rankings to go back to. So do you want us to do this in relation to how we see these benefits or how the, the previous committee had, you know, how those people had done it in the past? Right now in relation to how you see it, given okay. what you've known has changed over time. And then if we want to go back and you want to say, hey, what was ranked higher than uh, the other um, there, I will give you the secret clue, which is the order that they're in now. Um, the far left is the highest ranking. Um, from the original and the far right was the lowest ranking, but some of them were so close. Oh, sorry, actually it's the other way around. The far left yeah, is the right. lowest ranking, far right is the highest ranking, but some of them are tied. So for example, these two public open space or dedication um, uh, or easement uh, public parking, those were actually tied. So that's why I'm saying, I think it's less important at this stage to look at what, um, what the previous one and more to know that these were their criteria. So we can either go in the order that they're in now, starting with community benefits, or if there's a particular component of these that you would like to start the conversation off with, we can jump around. This is pretty flexible. I'll, I'll start at the risk of being very unpopular, but can we slam public parking under community benefits all the way to least important? Because we, right. we've got plenty of parking. I think that it's just a misconception that we don't. Great start. Then what I'm going to jump. Think? I'm going to jump back in and say I disagree. It should go somewhere towards the middle because <laughs> I I don't think it's it's I don't think that it's uh, towards the end. Let me zoom. And I will second Pat because the business business owners I have spoken to often talk often. about that. Yeah. yeah they all, they and I think it varies. Them. I think it varies between buildings so to, to I, ah. I i think it varies between buildings or, or between locations maybe that that may be the better word so then you get to see the test here yeah that's that's a good point pat because cottage street is not the same as uh union may, yeah or yeah Okay. So you can see I can then add that comment straight in here. So when we get back to doing evaluation criteria, we have that nuance there. So that's really, really helpful. I would say building location. I, I don't know if that you'll, you'll understand, I think, but yeah. Yeah. Just because I know in the plan, once, once Union Street is fully redeveloped, I think half of that parking goes away, correct? Correct. Or not half, but a portion of it, right? Okay. All right. A good portion of it. And then that's and that's where most of the conversations I've heard were related to the Union Street yep. piece, yep. if you will. Okay. So just to push back on the parking situation, it, I've never not been able to find a parking spot like within 
a 45 second walk of where I was going. Uh, I know that everybody wants parking in front of the business, but there's already parking in front of the business. We're not going to improve that at all. Well, we could marginally improve that. But if we're looking to add parking like a garage, just hypothetically, that's not going to do anything. Right. You know, it's, it's still going to be a 45 second or two minute walk to where you're going. And that's already available. But I understand what everyone's saying. You know, the, it's, it's the convenience is not necessarily there, but we only have so much space and that's convenient parking's already there. Just full. I, I think this is great. The, and Chris, you like you. I think you hit one of the one of the harder ones right off the top here. You know, something that I would want to like relate to the group. The, something that comes up too. It's it, it's and Emily. I don't know how to document this yet, but it's something about the the degree to which we need parking, right? So mm -hmm. if if there was a way that we said like twenty parking spaces, you know, you know that might that might fit in pretty good. Um, the, the counter, the counterbalance is, you know, the, the argument. And, and I think we would just be forthright and say like for Maple street in particular, like cottage streets really thriving, you know, the, it had, it came up during the community meetings that the, the building should just be demolished and it should just be 120 parking spaces. Right. So somewhere through this is like that, I would agree with Chris, like that level of parking goes way to the, the less important. But if there's like a way that there could be 20 parking, 20 public parking spaces as part of a project like that might slide up some to some degree. And I think same thing with Union Street, like, you know, we are going to lose, you know, in the order of like 20 spaces out of 60. So, you know, the idea of making up maybe some of those, um, at center Pepin, like that might, that might change where you put it on the scale. So, so just the degree to which we're talking about public parking might, might factor in here. Yeah. Th thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, we should, we should not consider it as an all or nothing as far as parking goes. <laughs> right. And again, this, this becomes the balance, right? Is, you know, where does public parking fit yeah. in among some of these considerations, but also stage two is where does public parking fit with all of the rest of these as well? Because I think the most, the, there's sort of two really critical pieces in thinking about this is you're not going to get everything because it's not going to be financially viable for a developer to hit everything. So this is obviously one of the reasons why we're doing it. And then the other piece is how do we balance the flexibility of what we're asking with the control of what we're asking? Because obviously the more flexible we get, the more likely we'll get the developers responding, but we don't want to be so flexible that we don't get the priorities for the community in. So that's why this is actually taking three conversations for us and possibly a little bit more. More. Yeah, and you Jeff, know, can I, can, Jeff, can I ask a quick question about parking? So, like, you know, first of all, we're also be trying to be a little bit proactive to think of the future and with hopefully a growth of community or business. But when you have these, when we have these businesses that are side by side by side with just a single row of parking spaces in front of them, from the planning board perspective, can a business say, Part of, because I believe, as I remember, yeah, you know, business needs to say, I have this parking for my business. Can you, can they say municipal parking is right there? Does it promote businesses by comp new businesses being able to say, part of my parking and my permit or whatever is going to be in this municipal lot? I think it's, it's close. I think it goes to, I think what Chris says, the perception of the parking. So the way our zoning is pretty, admirable like so as a planner a lot of other planners talk about our zoning is good where if you look at one of the small shops on cottage street they are not required to provide parking um as long as they're not building something new like if the the analysis we usually use is like if you have a one-story building and you want to change the tenant to a bar or something like that you, you don't need to require you don't need to provide parking if you add a second story and new space you might have that conversation but the idea is that um then you look in the surroundings and there is some need for there to be some parking somewhere in the vicinity you know where they're 
where their customers can park. So it's a little bit, you know, in the middle um, that we want to have some parking available um, to support visitors and who, whatever business they want to kind of patronize is, is important. Um, the, the, the two things I really, I guess I really wanted to quickly mention is that oh, over the past several months, so in May, June, and July, um, I um, went out and counted um, the number of cars parked on in the Cottage Street area, um, kind of because it's a supplement to where we are going with this conversation. And we were lucky enough to open up 25 spaces behind Maple Street School. And then, so we were counting that and all the on-street parking on Cottage Street and over the course of the summer on the, on the busiest day was, you know, 15 cars were parked at, in the 25 spaces behind Maple Street. And that was the absolute maximum height of that, of using that. So we have a little bit of data to, to show that we might want to try to incorporate some parking at Maple Street, but the number doesn't have to be hundreds or a parking garage and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, then, you know, the other thing, maybe Emily to throw around with parking is on street parking. So, mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of this thing where we have this school on both sides. We have this school, they're, they're purpose built schools and on street parking wasn't like a big thing. So, you know, we do have an opportunity to, to see if through public infrastructure, there could be additional on street parking too. So if we want to talk about adding a little bit of parking, it doesn't all have to be on the site. It could be worth looking at, you know, some of the streets around it and incorporating some on-street parking. So, Joe, I'm not sure I answered your question totally, but um, I think Union Street is the same idea where, you know, what we did with the Union Street analysis is that there are a lot of businesses that have their own off-street parking already. So if you look at, you know, the the package store next to Pride, so they might, they are losing two parking spaces in front of their business as part of the redevelopment, but they have some number of parking spaces offsite. So Union Street has a lot more offsite parking mm -hmm. um, available and it's kind of just maximizing that. So some of those businesses can change tenants without require, without adding parking. Mm -hmm. I will say that parking also comes in when we do get down to the site discussion um, below, there's a little bit about uh, parking uh, um, again, in terms of design to, to just keep in mind that we get to hit the subject twice, so. So, and I'm gonna say, you know, part of me, just because of the way you um, put them up here and, and I'm cheating a little, cause I do have the book in front of me. <laughs> um, but considering that those two things, you know, that parking was, it was tied for first place or maybe not first, maybe third, somewhere in that mm. uh, second or third, place somewhere in that range to, to bump it all the way down to the end just doesn't seem right because I don't think the folks, I don't think the public's perception or, or, or attitude has changed towards wanting more parking. I, I get it. I agree with you, Chris. I have rarely had it. Although I will tell you, I just went to Amy's to get food to be clear uh, before I came here. Um, and I ended up part, I did go through the lot and I did go through Cottage Street and I ended up having to park on the side street just to get, and that's on a random, you know, Wednesday night. So it's, it can be an issue for some people sometimes. So I think bumping it all the way to the end is, is not a good plan. And I, and I agree. I don't think that they need a parking garage at Maple Street or 120. I, I agree with what you're saying there, Jeff and Chris, as far as Maple Street per se. Can I just chime in on the on the parking? Is this a place to talk about just having more signage that there is parking? I don't think a lot of people realize there's parking at the Maple Street School currently. And if, Jeff, you only saw 15 spaces full, that might be because some people might not know it's there. So that's a great actually jump down and there's no reason we can't jump between for some of these circulation access and parking parking signage and signage and wayfinding were two uh, components that came out. So, you know, Pamela, based on what you're saying, I think maybe, you know, these start to come down a little bit to here and then we can see where they go as we move the other components in there. 
So, you know, if you're going to offer public parking as part of this, then you need to have the appropriate signage to get people there. Makes a lot of sense. Now we mentioned balance earlier, and this, this is a good time to bring up a concept that I think we're going to hit a couple more times during the discussion. We have um, a few things that maybe work against each other in here. So enhanced tax revenue, payment for on-site or off-site improvements. As we think about those, you know, somebody being required, for example, to provide public parking and on-site and off-site improvements and enhanced tax revenue. That's where we start to see things working against each other in terms of what we'd actually get for our response to this RFP. So um, as you think about this, where do you feel that those might fall on this line? Um I'm not sure if I understand what payment for on-site or off-site improvements means in this context. Absolutely. So let me just pull it over here. So the way it was uh, um, brought up in the report is indirect civic benefits through off-site or on-site improvements, additional funding for activities that benefit East Hampton residents. Um, usually when you think of off-site improvements, it tends to be um, something more physical like uh, circulation um, improvements, you know, uh, developments might do a traffic signal. I think here the fact that it was left a little bit loose is kind of interesting, the additional funding. So, you know, that could be if, for example, the neighborhood part or the, the playground is removed as part of the development, maybe the funds go to a neighborhood playground elsewhere, um, that's also going to, you know, that also should feed into our discussion of benefits, because that's certainly something that we heard was of interest in preserving. So that's how that would be um, uh, thought of. I wonder about that one, you know, and what, what Lauren asked and what Emily said, you know, like the, the public park is listed somewhere else. And I think, you know, each of the school sites has a playground if it's not a school anymore, I would argue maybe the playground's excessively large, but to have something still there. So like, even with the on or offsite improvements, I think we have a little bit of play as to what we're talking about. So like, I think I would throw out um, uh, the public space, the public open space like might be important some to pull down, but but like off street, I mean, sorry, off site parking, like, for example, I would put lower on the list because I think, you know, there's other sources that the city can try to gather for that. So like whether it's a grant um, for infrastructure. So if we tease those apart a little bit, I think the park idea had come up a lot and that might be really important for the neighborhood, whereas the on street parking or something like that, you know, we probably don't want to try to burden them with building the whole rebuilding the whole street. You know that kind of thing so to each one of these i think emily maybe you said this but like each one of these might have little components to them too mm -hmm. yeah we could we could split this up um just as a um sorry just thinking about how i wanted to split it up uh i've got this so this for example could just come over here and maybe we would do the public open space there. And then I put the public off-site parking just for the sake of argument here. And then again, we can move these around on the, on the line, but does that, Jeff, does that reflect accurately? I think so. And I'm not trying to, you know, say too much i just think like there within each of those there's, there's little pieces that we can flush out too yeah at as much detail as we want to get but i think um, it's a great example of how we can flush out that one that one piece so if you if you all have more that you want to add to that um you know please do so i mean i'm coming through kind of the memo which has some of the criteria too and, and i think to hopefully help help the conversation but i think like to, to talk about affordable housing would be good at this point because it's hard because you can't see the whole board and I was looking to where it would fall. I think it falls under building uses, you know, because I think that's a, we heard a lot of that. And I think that's something that we've learned over the last year with our housing production plan. So I, I would love yeah. to just 
hear people talk about that a little bit and see what see where we think about that. Yeah, so building uses, you're absolutely right. We have the affordable housing, diversity of housing types, and artists live work. Um, that actually ties neatly with the community benefits where it was talking about younger versus older. So I think, again, there's a play here that will get fleshed out in the next stage, but I think it's important to, um, to understand that there's that play there as well. So I'd love to talk about affordable housing because I think you're right, Jeff, that not only during the planning process, but also post-planning, that seems to become a, um, a much sort of a higher level of uh, uh, intensity on that conversation. So if we were to move that onto the slider again, based on what we heard in the um, uh, planning uh, meetings and again since then, it would be a little bit higher you know, it'd be towards the high end. Any, I'm not seeing any disagreements on that at the moment. For me, it's most, it's most important, sorry. Me too, actually, I agree with you. Um, I was gonna say though, the artists live work. Uh, Jeff, we went and visited, um, I think it was Worcester, and they had those mills that they made into living spaces with um, studios and shops actually integrated into the living space mm. i don't know what that's called is that live artists live work is, is that the same thing okay i think it's similar i think it's similar enough to find it kind of fit there yeah 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 again if you wanted to to put the the nuance in there i can pull over and you know do a studio studio and retail some of them do it um, where the it's it's the it's the living and it's the studio, but the retail isn't open all of the time. That's where you get the those you know annual or, or semi annual open studios. But I've seen others where the retail is is integrated into it, so or the retail component um, year round rather than just at specific points. But Jeff, did you say? I mean, uh, Chris, did you say live, living too? Yeah, they, they, they had these mills that were converted to um, basically apartments with a, with a front space for retail or art studio, which is kind of neat. Did you ever see the show Black Books, Joe? No. Okay. It's sort of like that. It was a bookstore in the front, and then he lived in the back. <laughs> okay. I mean, one. I wonder, Emily, you know, because it doesn't really show up in the set of criteria. But I, I, I don't want to muddle this up either. But I wonder, just like for comparison, if we made a a sticky note for market rate housing, and like, because I think, I think that's because somewhere in it, in there is the diversity of housing types, which I think is important. And I don't know what that says on the side, but. I think to just draw the comparison between our desires to support market rate housing versus affordable housing, I think, you know, I think this would be a great exercise to just hear. I, I think I know where most people would fall on it, but to have the group just talk about that for a second would help draw the contrast. And let me just, uh, diversity of housing types uh, adds to the diversity of housing within downtown. So, but it's not, uh, to, to your point, Jeff, and it's a good one, this criteria doesn't speak to the physical layout of the housing types versus the affordability of the housing types. So that's something else where if you all want to tease that out further, I think that makes a lot of sense. So I've got the, the market rate housing is now in here. Um, and can be placed on the scale sort of anywhere you all think it's appropriate. Well, you know, I think that's important because, you know, I'll tell you my time on city council, everybody loves affordable housing, but, you know, it's not the city who is going to build it. It is a developer who thinks they can find a way to make some money doing it. And so I think it's, you're kidding yourself if you think you're going to have a hundred percent affordable housing without a developer being able to make what they think money back or some money back without market rate housing. So, you know, I, people just don't come in and, you know, there has, to, the city or the government doesn't build these things themselves. You need a private developer who's willing to do it and they're going to do it if they can at least make some money at it. So I think you have to look at those two together to make them realistic, in my opinion. 
So, I, Joe, I would say it sounds like it's it's a little bit closer to the affordable housing. At this I think point. they have to have a mixture of it. I don't think you okay. could pull it off. I mean, maybe, but I just don't. I haven't seen it yet. But thoughts on that? I agree with that. I think one of the problems with affordable housing is that the well is just too deep of people who want to come in here. So you can create 2,000 units in the city, and they're just going to fill up, and you're not going to really make a change. And that's the thing that worries me the most. And I've been thinking a long time about how do you escape that, um, how you escape that trap. And I, I don't really have, nobody has any answers for that. But I'm wondering if you prioritized or made a requirement for the developers to rent or lease the apartments out to East Hampton people. Mm. That forces East Hampton, doesn't force, but it gives opportunity to people already living in East Hampton to move to a newer place and freeing up another apartment, which kind of creates... Um, it creates not a, a price war, but it creates more supply for the amount of demand we have. And then people who want to come into the city have to move into the places that are vacated by these Hampton people moving to the new places. And I don't know if that's a solution. I don't know if it's even um, legal to require that or request that in an RFP. But I don't, I don't know. Just the affordable housing well is just so deep in the whole, the whole country, the state, and then especially this region. And I, you know, it's so anyway. You can do local preference. Um, uh, up to seventy percent of the units don't don't hit me if I get the numbers wrong, but it's only for the first round. So after after they've been filled the first time, it's no longer local preference after that. But you can okay. put that in the RFP. So and it's certainly a strategy to indicate that you're trying to address existing sort of current local needs as well as future needs. Do you happen to know where that seventy percent requirement is is mandated from? Is that a state law or DHCD, HUD law? Yeah, it's okay. a, I believe it's state rather than okay. HUD. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I have, I have concerns yeah. about, um, I, I support the idea of having um, a requirement to have some affordable units. I'm concerned about the condos going up at Ferry Street and that none of them will be affordable. And I'm concerned about who that will attract and what that will say about East Hampton going forward. And um, what's, you know, I won't be able to move there or my friends. And so to have some kind of a balance mm. against that sort of development, I think is crucial. And what wasn't the wasn't the plan for for Ferry Street to have a percentage of of affordable dwellings there, and it and it somehow fell through. I mean, that's it seems like that's kind of always happens with these developments. As far as I know, one guy owns the whole thing, and he's like, "Yeah, I don't know, no, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't have to. I've got my own money." The city and the state have asked him to consider affordable units, and um, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, he's like, "No," so. So this is a great segue into, um, again, what we'll be delving deeper into next uh, month, but this idea of uh, the requirements and the evaluation criteria, and you can go either way on this. You can require that, you know, in responding, they have to meet certain affordability levels that that gets to the more control, less flexibility side. On the other hand, you can do it in the evaluation and say, we'll consider you to be more advantageous if you provide this level of affordability and less advantageous if you provide a lesser one. That gives a little bit more flexibility, but also signals your, your values and your needs. So one of the reasons we're doing the exercise this way is so that we can start to parse out where do we need to break that down versus evaluation versus um, uh, requirements for some of these things. And some of these things may just be a straight, easy requirement. If you do public parking, you have to have a signage, you know, done. <laughs> some of that like affordable housing and where we come down on that, I expect that to be a much longer conversation about how, how we set that up. But it's good to know that, you know, this is a critical part of the conversation because then we can spend more time on it. I think, yeah. you know, um, something that Pamela said about, you know, Ferry Street, the, it, there's some facts that you said, and I'm not, I'm, it, there's a whole thing over there that is hard to untangle. But the, the difference here is that this is actually a, a u relatively unique situation where the city 
the city owns these and we, this is like so i think i want to kind of like really promote what pamela was kind of suggesting here which is you know we could actually try to make a difference with with this um in terms of making them affordable housing you know if that's if that's a route that we ultimately go we have a little bit more control whereas like when ferris is a private developer we don't have a lot of control over that um one 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 of my notes is that um under the emily emily you said uh, the page on the right the frame on the right kind of describes yeah. everything so i think the way the affordable housing was written was that it would be 15 percent of the units yes um so so that in some ways that could be like the minimum thing that we could try to get um in terms of the reuse of the school there are you know housing developers that focus solely on affordable housing mm -hmm. and the anecdotal information that we hear is that for a developer, especially an affordable housing developer to come in, they might actually want to do all the units as affordable um, because when they put together how all the, the funding for everything, the more units that they do together, the better tax credits they can get, which I think goes to Joe's point is so that's how they actually make it work. But I, I kind of wanted to just throw out like um, somewhere in the advantageous ranking or, or whether it's required, like making a hundred percent of the units affordable because um, i think at the end of the day if we're talking about renovating the buildings some of the numbers i, I just want to kind of give the committee a little bit of information like we're, we're starting to get a little bit of data which it's subject to change but in all three of the school buildings like it looks like some of the numbers that if the every all three schools were converted to housing maximizing it you know we're, we're talking about like 60 units you know, that's like a ballpark figure that keeps keeps kind of coming up. So, you know, shooting for a hundred percent of those to be affordable should pop up for us at some point. And I think maybe as Emily was saying, maybe at the next meeting we we start talking about whether that's required to do a hundred percent or whether it would be like highly advantageous if we can get a developer who's gonna come in and say, I in all three schools, I can convert them to affordable units and that's sixty units and they're all hundred percent affordable like that. In some ways that should be highly advantageous along the along our trajectory just and then people who come in they say oh we can only do 15 percent of the total units as affordable then that might rank kind of low so i just wanted to throw that out there and see where where it sticks i also want to just make it a little bit more complicated because it doesn't have to sorry jeff uh it doesn't have to be just the percentage of units that are affordable but also the percentage of area median income so for example you could say we want it to be you know 100 percent at 80 percent ami or we want 50 at 60 and 50 at 80 or we want 15% to be 30% AMI. So, you know, there's there's some pieces in there. Again, the more control you place on that, the less flexibility a developer has to respond, but you can also put it on the criteria. You could make it as general as we would find a mix of affordability levels, more advantageous, or you can be much more specific and say, we don't care what you do with the rest of it, but 15% of those units have to be 30% AMI or whatever. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking over the next month that there's some gradation, further gradations you could do if you want to. Jeff, can I ask a question? Um, so if we if if it went 100% affordability and, and we got all 60 units in there with, what was it, 7,700 housing units we've got in the city, do you think that would make any noticeable dent and i'm not taking a position at all i'm just curious from the planner perspective it, it would i mean at this point any affordable units that we can get it will help um just to go back like so so a couple things is that our housing production plan which is you know it's the document that the state wants every town or city to have to kind of it, it sets up like how many affordable units should we be trying to achieve every year and so that number is roughly 35 units of affordable housing every year is is what we're supposed to be trying to get and that's super hard to do um it said we haven't put affordable housing units we haven't built new affordable housing units since 2015. um in that year though we put on um parsons village came online 
which I think if I get my numbers, I get them back to, uh, backwards sometimes. I think Parsons Village was 38 units. And then the same year, right on Cottage Street, um, the mill building that faces Nashawanic Pond, you know, was converted to uh, 50 affordable units. So in that one year, we put on a lot of units. But since 2015, we there haven't been new units built. So we kind of have this backlog now where if we did get 60, that would put a noticeable dent. That would, that would achieve two years worth of our, you know, attempts that are sort of our targets. Um, so that would be, that would be huge. I think it would be really important for us to try to get as close as possible to that. A follow-up question to that. Would, would those 60 units preclude any commercial use like on the first floor? Um, we don't have enough data. I don't think yet to, to answer that fully. Um, but I, I would hazard a guess. Yes. I think if we, if we shot at 60 and that, that's a number that's subject to change, I think one of the things we want to do is have an architect draw out the buildings. And then once we have that, then they, then they can look at how to break it up. But I think it would Lauren. I think, um, you know, the higher number of units we get, the less commercial would be in them. I think generally as a, as a across the board kind of statement. So um, Lauren is to segue to that, you know, um, building uses, commercial wasn't listed in the final criteria in the plan, although that was talked about and, and benefits is a commercial use, something that's important to this group. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so in that uh, same area, um, you know, I, I heard a lot about this um, when I was out collecting signatures and talking to people in the community. Um, what would it, it, would it be more desirable to developers, um, like from, from their affordability or profit standpoint to like, let's say the first floor of one building is, um, you know, offices for um, social workers or, um, you know, advocates um, for the senior citizens and people with disabilities, and then to have the housing be set aside for that population. Um, so really, like, the idea would be, you know, if we have senior citizen housing, um, that their caseworkers could be on the first floor, which prevents them from having to, you know, travel across town or you know, walk across busy streets as an example. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if, if office spaces are uh, cheaper to build. Um, so I don't know how that factors in, but just a thought. I think that's a good, good thought. thought. I, that's what I was going to say. Um, and I think some of it depends on the type of developer who would look at our the project and some of them are all housing yeah. and then some of them are more like an agency who might do both i think if we got an agency who did that in-house uh, with ho housing and services that might that might fit but if you have like a housing developer who doesn't have the services component then it would i think it would be hard to merge them together it'd be kind of like forcing two things together that may not work yeah. um but I think that's a good discussion piece. And then I think for Lauren's um, question, there was a there was a place um, under community benefits actually for arts and culture. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the actual description of it, kind of um, to provide the benefit through function or activities for East Hampton artists community. So I, mean, I recall like a lot of the discussions were like maker space or like, you know, a, a studio space that's open to the public or it could be rented or something like that. So that's, that's kind of as close as we got to commercial. Although that said, there were like mixed uses and, you know, a lot of the discussions that came up during the public meetings for the downtown plan were like, um, there's a couple of buildings in Oregon in Portland that have been converted. Like these old school buildings were converted to like a bar and a restaurant and like all the way through, you know, it's all been converted. Um, and so that did come up, but it appears like it didn't achieve the final list. So, you know, Emily, I don't know how we want to handle that kind of stuff like use or commercial to see where it fits on the board. Um, 
So I think we can we can certainly add it here um, to the community benefits because I think it really would be uh, more of a benefit than an actual. Brad, you were asking about sort of a, a um, the cost of building. I think there's also the revenue is whether or not these spaces could be rented for some of these uses with the downtown right there. But I think we should certainly add it in as part of our discussion. It could also be part of the um, either the valuation or sort of a menu is we would like to see one or two or more of the following spaces and then we could list out services for seniors or cafe slash gathering space or maker space as you know we'd like to see this provided we'll leave it up to you as to how you do it so that's that's something else to keep in mind um jeff real quickly is there um is there any kind of zoning hurdles that we would need to go through um for this you know, the schools. So like as an example, um, if somebody did want to use the space for commercial reasons, do we need to go back to the drawing board to rezone the schools for that reason? Or are, you know, I don't know exactly how they're listed and what you can actually do right now, or do we need to change that? That's a good question. I mean, I think that the zoning is good for for that um it, they're both kind of within the downtown business district which allows the greatest flexibility um and i think that's important uh we are we are doing some tweaks to the we have an overlay district that kind of goes over and the overlay district is to support housing development so denser housing development and that we're we are going through the process now to make some tweaks to that to make sure that housing would be viable in the schools so it's kind of the, the it's kind of the opposite where like business uses would kind of work in terms of zoning housing we're we're almost there we're going to make some tweaks it should be approved you know presumably but by like january february we should have the zoning kind of all set to support additional housing i think the thing that we will run into down the road a little bit is probably not so much zoning, but like building code requirements. Mm. So so changing uses is gonna trigger ADA compliance, elevators, energy code. And so I think a lot of these things will, those might be barriers to certain other things. And I, um, I just wanted to say that, cause I think we, we can always imagine the coolest thing to go in there, but then for a developer to buy the building and make the upgrades and then seek a tenant for that, you know, that, that may be a barrier that we'll run into a little bit further down the road. Um, the one other thing I wanted to mention is um, escaping me, which is really unfortunate. I was going to, um, it might pop up here. Um, it was the, sorry, it was the intergenerational use. Mm -hmm. So just kind of riffing off these conversations that, you know, we want to kind of hit some of these head on. Um, both, all three buildings had been pegged for maybe some kind of intergenerational use, but I think when you look at the buildings themselves, Pepin has an auditorium and a gym. And I think for all of us to just be aware that people have identified that as like, maybe that's valuable and maybe it should be part of the reuse plan. And so I kind of want to just, I'm trying to hit, get us with like the big ones, like kind of hit them head on. Um, so, you know, I think, I would be curious if anyone has any input on that and then comparing, you know, the, those values and those things as we kind of march forward. I mean, I think it scored pretty high on the questionnaire and that's also one of the comments I hear most in the community is people want some of that, would like some of that, the building to be used, you know, that you hear the gym mentioned time and time and time again, whether that be something that could be used as intergenerational, that this open space could be used as a gym, it could be used for readings. And, you know, I, I think that's a, that certainly is a priority that I hear a lot. Um, I do have one quick question to tie into this. Are we talking about one RFP for the three buildings? We talk about three different RFPs and could someone say, okay, I'm gonna make 100% uh, uh, for housing out of center, but 50% or, I mean, how, how, is, how are we looking at the RFP? Is one for all these schools? Is that how we're looking at it? So it is not decided. I think we have to continue to work through that and flesh it out. I think there's a couple different ways it can shake out, you know, but the idea that 
we are flexible, I think is kind of the key element and figuring out how we are the most flexible when we release the RPs is kind of sort of yet to be determined. But, you know, I think Joe, like once we have enough information about each of the three schools and we kind of have these advantageous kind of components built out, then we kind of, we might, and this is just one option, but we release them and one developer could do all three for different purposes, or one might pick one school. Um, you know, we don't know how that's going to shake out yet, but I think flexibility will be key um, where they might want to look at the buildings individually and then come up with a proposal that best suits the building and then best suits our criteria. Um, Emily, do you want to add, add to that at all? Yeah, we've been talking, I think it's it's going to be a single document. The question is, does the RFP say you must do all three schools or does it allow you to choose a combination? Um, and and we, uh, as Jeff said, we haven't decided yet. I think there's some implications if you, if you open it up for the flexibility and everybody responds for two of the schools and, and one school gets left out in the cold. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you may get a smaller developer who says, you know what? I can do one school. I don't want to do all three. And do you want to leave them out of it? So we're not we're not quite there yet. I think as we as we pull together the information, as we pull together what what you're talking about, that will continue to be part of what we all discuss. I think it'll be a pretty key you know conversation of this committee, and then you know realizing that the work of this committee is going to generate that document. The document, the RFP document, is has to go to city council. You know, and city council kind of has to agree with the framework that's been established. So, so Joe, I think it's a really good question. I think over the next couple of months, we should continue to keep asking that. And as the committee gets more information and as we all become more accustomed to what we're going to be doing, you know, we keep asking that question and whatever answer we come up with, you know, it'll be important to explain to the city council why we, why we ended up there. Like in, in October, we didn't know what the disposition would be but by you know let's say next i don't know um april or may when we send it to city council we'll have clarity on that and we'll have an explanation as to here's why we decided to do it this way so it'll be important it's going to be asked kind of along the continuum um and there will need to be an explanation to like the full city council as to what whatever the decision was right and that can certainly fit into the overall financial considerations um, discussion that we'll have. So, um, uh, which is a lot, uh, a component is the benefits to the town and, or the city rather, and a component of it is um, whether or not the person responding can actually do the job, which is important. So, you know, that may weigh into how we set up the RFP in terms of the options for how many schools we're looking for. You know, I think uh, I think it's probably important to realize the developers going to look at these buildings, especially Pepin and Center, and they're going to consider that one site. It's going to be very difficult to market those two buildings separately for a redevelopment project. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Maple certainly is on the other side of downtown, and if we were going to go in that direction, those would be the two locations in the RFP. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is the right place to say it, but for the affordable housing aspect of things, can we um, add a consideration to nonprofits that want to do more work in the future in the city towards building units or taking mm -hmm. over units and sort of real estate investment trust? I think the problem with that, though, is that, and I think we've made this mistake in the past as a city, is making things too stringent and then you don't get good RFPs. But I think a consideration would be good there. Mm -hmm. Chris, does that capture it? Yeah, that's okay. good. Thank you. Yep. So we've hit on a couple just to call out the ones that we haven't talked about yet, just so that they're in your minds and then we can jump back some more. We do have architectural design, basically how would how do we preserve existing architectural characters? So we can talk about that. Um, 
for anything new compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood and then not just building design but also site improvements and then the other one we haven't really talked that much about um, or the other two we haven't talked that much about is one is compatibility so we touched on zoning and whether or not the zoning needed to be changed it's also how do the uses on the site um, impact the neighborhood in terms of traffic and, and management of traffic what uses are happening on the site during the day and how does that impact the flow of the neighborhood and also nighttime uses which could include lighting or noise um, especially if there's a, a non-residential use in there and then terms of sustainable development um, and design uh, you know at the time it was looking at lead certification and then just overall sustainable design there of course are a whole load of other certification programs other than uh, lead uh, sites well etc and so then the the question becomes is that something that's desirable, um, again, to an earlier point, is it something where you require the certification or simply require that they could be certified if they wanted to be? So just wanted to call those out for our thinking. You know, I think we also need to ad ad address, because I know when I took the tour of some of these older schools with, I think it was somewhere from, from Pioneer Valley, CDC or whatever, um, you know, these are not, I think I, you know, do, do, do developers look at these things like, oh, great, half the building is done for me? Or do they look at, you know, how do they look at it? And they say, no, we look at these like, almost like we have to almost gut them and start all over. So are we going to, is one of the requirements going to be that all these buildings exist as they are? Or can someone take a building down and put up, a nice looking, you know, neighborhood compatible, more modern, more efficient, more energy efficient, affordable housing project. I mean, is what, how are we sticking by our guns? These are historic, we're staying with it, regardless how much it's gonna cost a developer to make it housing, or we can say, no, if you can put in these housing units and make them efficient and make them affordable, you can take a building down. So I think that's one of the biggest questions this committee needs to wrestle with in terms of the, the structure of the RFP. And if it's, you know, if it's, we're going, we're going to require that they all be kept, you know, that leads to a, a set of criteria and the requirements and in, in the evaluation. But, um, and it's one of the reasons I actually liked the shorthand here. If, the, if we're going to say that they can be demolished um do we have some requirements about what can be kept are there interior exterior components that should be reworked into the building so mm -hmm. again that uh, that's a critical question mm -hmm. um, for discussion uh love to hear what you all have to say about that at least as initial thoughts for tonight so i think that's a great point joe um i think if we're looking at it from a flexibility standpoint we let we 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 don't require them to keep anything, right? Um, that's, you know, from the flexibility standpoint and getting the most RFPs for our buck. Jeff, when you did the calc, was it you who did the calculations for the 60 affordable house or 60 units on the existing schools? Um, not directly. We, the group that Joe just mentioned is a Valley CDC. Uh, so one of the, parallel projects that we have is they got some CPA money to to help us as part of this process is to look at what might be feasible in the buildings. And so they're fleshing it out. It's not done. But I think that we should be able to get a sense of the number of units that they could put in the buildings if they stay. Um, I don't know, but this is a good request is to this whole discussion is and so maybe that number 60, right? So that's the ballpark figure that I, I, I've heard. If we allow the demolition, like we would imagine that the number would increase probably that's significantly, it. right? And so uh, we don't know that number yet, but I think just generally, like Joe said, you could build it more efficiently, purpose built, you can change the, the layout and everything. So the expectation is that if you did allow them to be demolished, the number of units would be more. That's exactly what I was getting right. at. Okay, cool. That's the presumption. And I think this is like, you know, that I think is a great discussion. I, will, I don't want to talk anymore. I would like to hear what other people say. I think that's the general notion, though. I support 
uh, letting, letting them tear down and rebuild because I don't know if these buildings are super Im- important historically. I don't, I don't know that part, except that um, each of the descriptions mentioned poor air circulation. And if they're old, maybe there's old plumbing and all that stuff that causes problems continually for buildings around. Yeah, that's what Joe was saying. Everything, it, it's got to be gutted down to the bricks. Yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That's I was going to ask that same question. Um, I guess the next question I have is, um, as far as the historical, has there been any not that i'm asking anybody to do that but are there any claims is there are there any claims that there are historical now they're not on a registry somewhere where we're going to run into an issue where now it doesn't matter what we think they're they have to be kept that way i don't know how that process works that's why i'm just throwing it out there asking i i think maple is the oldest standing school in the state but i could be wrong on that which is you know a badge of honor and uh and you know and, something and not, else <laughs> not. <laughs> not. yeah so i i'm in agreement with everyone else if it or with the folks who have, have spoke already you know as far as you know in the event that a, a developer wanted to remove the building and and i i agree with joe uh, as well i i'm more than positive that folks are going to say it's way easier to tear it down and start over from scratch than to try and fix what's there yeah and i think that we're not you know it's the flexibility thing we don't have to require it to be torn down but if we Mm -hmm. open up the option we get our fees from both camps and we win yeah i brad were you gonna say something sorry oh i I was just gonna basically um agree with what most of you all have said um i've had significant uh, numbers of interactions with Valley CDC um, over the last year or so. Um, and I mean, they're definitely looking into these three buildings as a viable option. Um, but I know that their preference is blank slate um, because, you know, they have formulas for how to develop um, affordable housing to make the space as efficient and have as many spaces as possible. Um, and it is way easier to start from a blank slate um, than it would be, um, you know, specifically like with the ADA requirements. Like, you know, there are actual cookie cutter blueprints on how you can build affordable housing with these things included that you, you know, you couldn't do that as easily um, with the buildings as they're currently standing. So I think if we allowed for, you um, demolition to happen on any of these buildings, I think it's almost a certainty that Valley CDC would bite at one of these properties. Um, and then you would get 100% affordable housing. Um, and I, I think I want to say that they, their, their estimate was about um, 50 to 55 units um, per development that they do. So um, I, I mean, I don't know, compared to the size of the lots, if they could accomplish that, but um, that's generally what they aim for. So I think it's it, it's highly advantageous to allow it, even though I think the buildings look really cool. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to think about, you know, East Hampton for the next 30 to 40 years from now. So um, I think we have to consider that. Uh, is there anyone who, who, who thinks we shouldn't, you know, allow dem- demolition? We're all in agreement on that? Well, I would jump in. We didn't hear from Lauren. I was kind of curious, Lauren, if you had any perspective. But so, but we we were supposed to have a member of the historical commission sitting with us. So, I you know I I would not not play devil's advocate, but I would say that there will be people who say that they should be preserved. Um, it, you know, there is some level of consideration for that. Um, the neighbor, the context in the neighborhood. You know, it's. You know that's that's a value. The buildings, as far as we know, are not um, on the National Historic Register, which that is the designation that would start to impact the ability to to remove them. We do have a process in East Hampton for you know any building that's older than 50 years has 
has to go through this process of, of called demolition delay. And what it what it is is that any developer who proposes to demolish the building would have to go to the historical commission and document the history of the building, the nature and the condition of the inside and outside. And you know, for a structure that's really, really important, you know, they can delay they can say that we're not allowing you to demolish this until you seek alternatives. Um, and usually they can exhaust those and say that it's just not feasible to save the building. Um, and then they're allowed to demolish the building. I mean, I think that the, we will over the course of the process encounter a lot of people who are going to say that they should remain. Um, and so this is going to be a conversation that we'll have all throughout but I think what I heard, especially if we set some criteria, so we, I, I would say personally, as and I'm a resident too, and I, I went to Maple Street School and I, you know, I, all that, if, if we allow or start to allow the flexibility to, to demolish, I think we generally, I don't think we want to see market rate units, right? So I think, I think we have the ability to like, say, if, if you are going to demolish, then it would have to be like, 100% or close to 100% affordable units. And we would like, I think we would work in like a park and some public parking. Like, I think we have a lot more ability to rank those really high, highly advantageous things that must come with that. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And then I, Lauren, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I was wondering if you had any kind of thoughts on, on the historic. No. Part. And thanks for kind of, um, expanding on that because you know when when we talk about demolishing these buildings i get a little bit sad <laughs> um i you know i i'm 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 kind of an amateur historian so uh, and i think these buildings are really cool um you know the question is i guess what what is worth sacrificing for the most affordable housing so affordable housing is paramount i think to everyone in this group um but, you know, and, and it's really hard and expensive to repurpose these old buildings. Uh, you know, they've done it to the mills. I live in Eastworks, so I really appreciate the fact that that, that happened, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Um, and also, like, maybe, you know, one or two of the of this old buildings have to get demolished to reach our goals, and one is still standing. I mean, I think we have some different options here, but I think, like, the repurposing old buildings like this is part of what makes communities like this attractive and 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 interesting to live in uh, and i'm not not throwing affordable housing under the bus at all it's just that you know you 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 mentioned it yourself it's it's a consideration and so in my mind it's a consideration so I think that's important. I think two other things to think about is whether or not um, a portion of the buildings could be demolished as opposed to the whole thing. Do we throw that out? And then the other thing is, say they want to come in and, you know, somebody once says, I get much more units or many more units on this site if I, if I take it down, costs, et cetera, et cetera. Are there components of the buildings that could be easily reused? Um, you know, you see it in Europe all the time where they leave the facade up and everything behind it is new. Uh, there's a development in Boston. Um, it was going up uh, right before the pandemic, so they must have uh, finished it by now. But there was a bar called the Littlest Bar in Boston. They kept the granite hatter and um, a little bit of the wall around it and incorporated that into the new building. So are there pieces that would be important, you know, cornerstone reuse, something like that, some of the detail? Is that important uh, as part of the discussion if, 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 we, uh, if the RFP allows for total removal? Are there components that should be incorporated into the new development? I would back that if we could pinpoint important things that need that. You know, yeah. like like on Fer on uh, Ferry Street, there was a couple of couple of cupola. I don't know how to pronounce it, but but they did right. keep that. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but it's there. Um, yeah, I think you know it. There will be a little bit more information that we gather along the way um, in terms of that element, the historic historic preservation and the value of the properties. Mm -hmm. um, it's. It should be noted, though, along the, and I am not like I even, you know, I'm not even an amateur historian, but it is important to note that both 
um, Pepin and Maple were both added onto. And so we, we may find that there's see there maybe there's a minus or a plus or minus on that. Like the, there was the original Pepin is actually a good example. Like if you really looked at Pepin one day, the front that faces the library is the original. And if you really look carefully, like on the roof line and, and a lot of the features there, there's a lot of detail. And then the addition that they built in the back, it's like a straight wall. And so they just, you know, they, they, in the, in the 40 years difference, like they lost a lot of the architectural, like, you know, integrity of the addition. And I think Maple Street's a little bit more intact because they just copied it all. But Pepin is really like two buildings that when you look closely, they're, they're pretty different. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I think we'll gather a little bit more information as we go. One of the, one of the things is it comes back to the, the ability to renovate. So we hope to have, um, you know, a structural engineer is supposed to look at all three buildings and make sure that structurally they're, they're, they have the integrity, integrity they need to be renovated. And then the cost, like a, a change in use analysis is something that we talked about trying to obtain so that we as the community have a general understanding that to go from the school to housing, you know, here are the code requirements that they're going to have to meet, like an elevator and, and all kinds of ADA. And then if you do the school to commercial space, I think the, the code requirements go up in nature. So you have a lot more ADA requirements and a lot more things. So we might have a little bit of information about those implications before we get to the final RFP um, kind of process. And all of this, again, kind of bring back the full city council. So, so like they'll need to understand that these discussions have been had and like the idea of like allowing the demolition, you know, it'll be how, how are we waiting historic preservation versus affordable housing? And, you know, if just off this discussion, we would wait affordable housing higher. And so the city council will kind of have to have that same discussion too. But hopefully by then they have a lot more information available to them as well. The work that the committee has done put together. Yeah, if I have a question that's you know somewhat off topic, we don't have a height require a height limit in the city, do we, for building? Mm -hmm. And if we do, are the schools grandfathered in? Um, we do in the 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 overlay district that I mentioned before. It's actually quite generous, and I think um, it's a really good segue to the. There's somewhere in there was the site compatibility. Mm -hmm. You know that might be a discussion that we might want to have because, and I'd rather air it out now a little bit. Like I said, to hit things kind of head on, the the height limit of new development in the if you're doing affordable housing and you're doing the density is five stories. And so you know I think we we really don't have any five story buildings in the downtown, so we might. If we went that road of talking about demolition, that might be one of the, the sort of the neighborhood compatibility things that we might discuss. Like maybe, maybe we do put. Well, it goes against the idea of being super flexible, but maybe we look at like no more than four stories or something, just to make sure that we don't get something that is dramatically different. But yeah, the the height requirement is pretty liberal, pretty generous. Um, yeah. so the, right. the existing buildings are fine, and you could go up two more stories. Yeah, five's a lot. That, that's surprising. That's good. Jeff, actually, you mentioned in terms of other uh, topics, um, just to make sure that in this initial meeting, we air out kind of all of the big ones. Is there anything from our from the list that we've had uh, that you want to make sure that we cover tonight? I think, did we... It, I have under architectural design, and maybe I missed you moving the chart, the piece of the sticky note around, but it's the preservation of existing architectural character. Did we move that anywhere? We haven't moved it anywhere. I've got okay. important architectural elements um, next to removal to remind us that, that those two are linked, but we can certainly pull this down, um, you know, whether you guys want it more important or less important, um, I leave up to you, but we can move it onto the line. I mean, I don't want to speak for any of the members, but it definitely, in what I heard initially in the initial discussion, it got pushed down the line, at least past the, 
mid mid mark. Um, that that's that was my kind of takeaway of what we just talked about. But you know, that oh, might, it'll, it'll, yeah, it'll come up again, I'm sure. Um, I think that we hit the big ones. Uh, um, I would just throw out. I I had flagged a question about the enhanced tax revenue. Yes. And so, you know, it sounds it sounds odd that it it's enhanced, but I think it's really just that. I think one of the questions that we've I, you know I've heard just people talk about is, will this generate tax revenue? Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the honest questions I have is if we get affordable housing as a as a affordable housing developer comes in and says i'm going to take all three and we're just going to we're going to build affordable housing here they they don't pay taxes was my understanding of how that would work or if they're tax exempt like then that so um, I think it depends on who's doing it. If okay. It's, if it's a, a, a nonprofit who's doing it, yes. But if it's a for-profit um, and there's a mix, for example, of market rate or affordable, or even if it's if it's all affordable rental, um, I think it depends on the underlying structure. Okay. So, because I think the way you know we we kind of rationalize some of these, like if you look at River Valley Co-op, for example, like it, it provided jobs, but it also really uh, they they upgraded the site and they're paying taxes and like that's a that's a benefit that's economic development that's like that's a pro for the town. Here it's kind of one of these questions where we're not getting tax revenue now. Um, in fact, the school is probably dumping a lot of money in to keep the buildings maintained. So if we had affordable housing, like is tax revenue that important or how would you weigh affordable housing versus tax revenue? I think like that was one of the questions I think we will kind of grapple with along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. I mean, I, I have some thoughts on tax revenue in this situation. Um, you know, we have a $40 million budget. And so even if we had 50,000 in revenue from each property, which would be like a three, $4 million building, it's not going to be a very big, it's, it's a lot of money. 150,000 is a lot of money, but it's on a $40 million scale. It's not a lot. And so if we're going to sacrifice things like affordable housing at the altar, of that small percentage of budget, um, I wouldn't support that. Yeah. I think um, that's again, why maybe it might be a, a way to look at a, you know, a combination where you know, if someone is affordable how, housing center Pepin does market rate at Maple. Because um, I don't know, I think you will get a lot of pushback from the community is like, what all this? We took it down. And, you know, I, be, I mean, I think a lot of people, and I, I'm one of them, think we need affordable housing, but I think they're not going to be happy that there's, you know, that there, there's no tax income coming because of it. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, just imagine if a school bought up that property, another school, and 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 it came off the rolls, like, you know, as it is now. I think there would be a an uprising of folks that would be pretty angry that we that that was done. It's... So, question on that: you you've got affordable um, housing as a, a very high level. We've talked yeah. about do we um, uh, public open space, which is up here, do we preserve one or more, or you know, reduce site but size, but at least some of the the neighborhood lots. Um, I guess it's a question in terms of the community benefits. Is the um, is the open space? Is the twenty parking spaces? Are those more important than having dollars, or would you rather have the dollars coming in for the tax revenue and use those for parking wherever you want it or um, neighborhood park wherever you want it? You see, you see what I mean is where, where's the balance in some of these? Because you're not, you're highly unlikely to get enhanced tax revenue and keep one or more of the playgrounds and get those 20 parking spaces. So where do they start to fall on this line? What, what about any kind of um, paid parking? I know parking, every, 
I like free parking in town, but what about like Northampton where you have to, you can get a parking app, uh, but then someone would have to walk around and give parking tickets. But anyway, would that and be worthwhile enough revenue to make it worthwhile to consider? And if you did that, would you have to then, um, you would probably have to expand that to the entire downtown because paid parking on one site this you know everybody's just going to ignore it and go for the free parking so i think yeah i don't know that paid parking will work it's a uh it's like a be a hornet's nest just the the free parking is actually a real benefit anecdotally a lot of people really appreciate the free parking in east hampton as, a, as opposed to smaller towns but um I guess to just keep us moving, I, the enhanced tax revenue right where it is is fine for now. I think we've talked about it a little bit, so it, it is on the it is on the line, and I think it's important that it be there. Um, the two other quick things I I wanted to just help air out a little bit was um, the seniors. Yes, so the seniors are kind of listed there, and um, they are super critical. Like generally speaking, we are an aging population. Um, all of our population is getting older, and we have a growing number. But um, that said, I think by the time we get through the winter and, and especially in the spring, you know, we there if you haven't if you don't know this, there's at least some a movement afoot to take the existing senior center from its current location and move it to Manchester Hardware, where it's um, the property was bought by uh, CHD. And so the, the, the idea is that CHD will renovate the space for a new senior center. So I think that's important for me to mention just because if that happens, we, we should know that it's happening before the schools are released for redevelopment. And I think in, in my mind, I think it relieves some of the pressure that we might have been hearing earlier on about you know, providing space for seniors. So in some ways that's kind of been, or in, in theory, there's a plan to um, provide that additional new space. So it takes that, I think it kind of might take that off the list and then the the young residents or youth, we think we cover that actually the intergenerational space, mm. um, the gymnasium. But one thing that we did talk about, and it's probably some data that we will gather along the way for the committee and for the city council conclusion process, is that the new school has um, new gymnasium space, and so. Uh, early on, so again, a couple of years ago, the discussion was, well, the new school that they're building now will only have one gym, and the high school has one gym, and that's not enough gymnasium space for what the current levels of activity are, but my understanding of the new school is that the gym space can be carved up into four, I think it's four, Pat, maybe you know this, but like, that it's more than one gym space, and so one of the things we kind of have to calibrate is with the new school coming online with the high school, what is our gym capacity for youth sports? And is it enough to satisfy the demand or, and, and really just trying to pin down, do we, do we really need the gymnasium at Pepin um, and kind of quantify it a little bit? Cause I think the notion is that we need to save the Pepin gym, but we don't really have the facts in front of us yet to know whether, whether we actually need it to support the existing activity level. So, um that's kind of like homework emily for us like along the way is to kind of flush that out a little bit because i think that will help like the senior center that might help tell us if if it's a real need or if it's kind of the feeling of the of the need um i think i mean you know it's really hard in COVID times to really get a good assessment of that but i think it's real because you know Jeff, when I was looking around for indoor pickleball space, Dave Motter told me, and Salem said the same thing, that every single gymnasium, school gymnasium in the city was taken by youth basketball. And I, th I think it's great, but there was no other space. We finally found, you know, the private East Hampton, you know, Neary School that let us use their gym, and now their COVID closed. You know, it's, it's hard to say now because of COVID, but I think, you know, when there is the demand that every single gymnasium is used seven days a week uh, b by one sports group, then there, there should be a need. But you can verify, you know, Dave Mott and other people about that, too. But that was my understanding. Yeah, that's good to know. I think it's just one of these questions that we'll get all along the process. So to figure out how to 
you know, Joe, I trust you and I Joe, I trust the former fire chief and, and our city councilor who's the youth sports coordinator, but I think we need to have some facts and figures to support that along oh, yeah. just to Absolutely. rationalize that that sure. use. Yep. Um I don't know. I, anyone who's looked at the list or, or glanced at this, does anyone else feel like we should tackle anything else that we didn't kind of touch on? Um, I just have one quick. So the financial considerations, again, yeah. I'm, I'm always tilted or tinted from coming from the city council. And you, br br you touched on it briefly, but is that, I mean, is this, is that somewhere we would put that the cost of this, of keeping these long term is to the city, you know, is that, or is it, is this financial consideration from a different perspective from the person we're selling it to? Because I think how long we hold on to this is a, is a, you know, an important thing to keep in mind and when we're doing our restrictions and our recommendations and all those things. It, it's expensive buildings to, to hold on to, too. So. So, so you're you're hitting the the point. I think there's there's two, two sort of sets of components. One is that the use is providing long term positive economic benefit to the city, which also goes to your point of it's not just that the new use is going to bring in some sort of either revenue or it's going to bring in people who are supporting new businesses or that component. But there's also, you no longer have the drain on the city slash school budget to keep these buildings going. Right. Um, and then there's uh, the comparative economic benefits. And in, in other words, this, this actually gets to that comparative criteria, the valuation criteria is somebody might have a, a higher package than others. Um, the other pieces were, uh, how quickly can this be done? So you don't want a developer who's going to be, you know, taking five years to, uh, or five years longer than somebody else to to do these buildings. And again, do they have the financial capability? And there, there are different ways of doing that. I've certainly seen any number of RFPs where they're required to provide references and letters of banks and evidence of construction, or uh, letters from banks, evidence of construction loans, things like that to let us know, uh, a, a pro forma development budget to let us know that they have the ability to do this evidence of past projects so it kind of splits into the what's important for the city and what's important for um for the perspective of who's actually going to get to do to this right. and this may be less of a sliding scale today as it is of when we get dive into the the criteria versus requirements mm -hmm. Joe, was your question about, was it about how long the city holds on to the building? Is that what well, you were Well, just the topic being financial considerations. I, I wasn't sure if we were looking at it from strictly what we can benefit from it versus what we're also losing by holding on to them for longer than, you know, if it's something to keep in mind and how restrictive we are right. is the financial cost of holding on them for if it, we have a lot of restrictions that make mm -hmm. it unappealing yeah so yep there's two things and and emily i was going to ask if you can you speak a little bit about what you saw with some of the other rfps about how like what towns had to do or didn't do and if they re-advertising them and that kind of thing like just have you encountered that a little bit in your research so far there have been i think three or four of the ones that I've looked at, I'm still uh, waiting to set up some of the calls. Uh, I reached out to them uh, last month and then, you know, we didn't get the date set up, but there were three or four where they had to re-advertise. Uh, we've talked about Amherst in the past. Um, there were a couple of, now at least two of them were, I think, more COVID related than anything else, uh, which is why I want to talk to them. But this is a consideration in developing the RFP is, again, we don't want to have to re-advertise because nobody responds responded because we were we were too strict or the the um uh the requirements and certainly one of the ones that i saw um submitted an addendum afterwards that significantly reordered the evaluation criteria which i thought was fascinating um uh, uh something that we definitely want to avoid uh you know they they 
I, I don't know if they were getting feedback from developers, maybe. So usually you issue the RFP, there's a question and answer or a question period. And then after the questions are received, uh, one or more um, uh, addenda are released saying, you know, here are the answers to the questions. Usually I have a site walk, a developer site walk in that period as well. So I don't know if these um, communities received feedback during the site walk that their evaluation criteria weren't doable. And that's what I'm waiting to set up the call on. But um, I was surprised to see that. So something that we want to avoid here. Yeah, I think because that's that does go into how long, um, you know, if, if we have to, if we release the RFP next summer or thereabouts and, you know, it's uh, close to early fall before you're going to get the responses back and the evaluation, then if that re RFP has to be re-released, then the, the city slash schools uh, are on the hook for keeping those buildings going through a second RFP round. And, you know, we would like to avoid that. Perfect. That's helpful. And then, because one of the things I thought Joe was asking about, but maybe not, but I think the the idea of the intergenerational use, and I think it's really looking at like the gymnasium, that, that concept, but the, you know, what I, what I have heard, and I think we just need to be cognizant is that like the city really has no, resources to take that mm -hmm. and, and and operate it and maintain it so i think you know if we move in that direction that we we think it's desirable to try to maintain it it's the i think the goal i think from from just general general observations and discussion would be that the the developer somehow gets an entity or or is able to take over that facility in terms of the maintenance because i think you know that would that would go that would be difficult. That would be a difficult discussion. Whereas, if the city is required to um, own it as a facility and maintain it, I think you know we will have a hard time, you know, doing that. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the gym because one of the communities I did get a chance to talk to, they had originally put out an RFP some years ago. It was the oldest of the RFPs I looked at for a school in which they were retaining the youth center as part of the school. Um, I, act, I was so old, I actually thought it had gone through successfully. And in fact, it hadn't. And they're re-looking at it. So some years later, mm -hmm. um, that school is still out there because the, the conflict of the uses wasn't working. So... Um, um, you know, if that's something that we do want to keep in as a possibility is understanding before we put it out there, how that might work will be really important. Okay. Great. Well, I think, um, you know, this is great. I know we're running long, so I, I don't want to like say we're done. If anyone else has something else they want to add, I think um, I did want to ask about dates Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, we are still waiting to hear back from, um, our grant, which is the, it's for the one stop for growth. So this, that's one of the parallel paths that we're running, which is that we are asking for money from the state to help us do work on the schools so that it tells us more data. And so we're waiting on that. And then I, we mentioned Valley CDC is running kind of this other parallel path with helping us understand the viability of turning these into affordable housing. So we should have some information, you know, probably not in December, but by by that winter meeting, you know, we should have that a little bit more information there. So those are just quick updates on that. Um, the member from the historical commission wrote to me and said that the that the uh, historic commission meets the second Wednesday of every month, which is kind of what we were targeting. Um, a couple of people said they weren't available or at least one person said they weren't available in December. So, you know, I guess I'm seeking some advice from the committee. Do we want to try to just break off of a regular schedule and want me to send a doodle poll or do we want to try to do the best we can to meet on the Wednesdays? Um, I, it would be great, I guess, to get out of the second Wednesday of the month to get the member of the historical commission here, but we're going to run into the holiday season too. So I guess, I don't know exactly how to, do this or if anyone has a strong preference um uh, can i just uh i had one more uh, i can yeah, perfect. Uh, um i have one more consideration for the the thing that we i forgot what it's called but can we have some sort of consideration for flexibility for the future so if we were to accept a, a proposal that had uh mixed use retail office and then affordable housing 
can we have a consideration to prioritize those that have a plan for how they could swap those around in the future as mm -hmm. needs dictate? Um, so say, say we run into a situation where we don't need affordable housing. That's not going to happen, but just as an example, if the space is ready or, 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 or built with that in mind to transfer over to retail or artist space or something like that, that would be great. Um, but to just question, I think the second Wednesdays are actually really bad for me too. So I think a doodle poll would be pretty good. Uh, I'm not married to a set schedule unless somebody else is. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with Chris. I think a doodle poll would be good. I, I just can't do December 8th. That's, that's where I'm at. That's where I am too. Okay. Okay. Doodle poll is good. I'm pretty flexible. All right. I'm going to go for it. Is the is the six o'clock time frame reasonable for people? I mean that that at least it kind of gets us out. I mean I know no one wants another night meeting, but I think that's if we stick to the six p.m. range, I think I can doodle pull that out a little bit. It would be great to get one meeting in November and one meeting in December, it's just to kind of keep us on track. Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. I'll, I'll work on that. I'll get it out in the next um, couple of days for everybody. Uh, um. It, we we could meet more than once a month if you think it's necessary. I think at least that's okay with me. I hate to volunteer anyone. I would say that I think as we get a little bit further along, we we may we may do that once or twice. But I just I think we're kind of going through at a, at a pace right now where Emily's still doing stuff and we're still gathering information. But at some point after the winter. You know that might that might be viable to just really button it up and really make sure we're taking all the steps. So I think we'll stick to once a month for now, but that that make that may come up. Um, great. So Joe, do you have any sort of thoughts or parting comments or questions or anything? No, no, no. I guess do we have to be official and, and ask for a motion to adjourn? <laughs> I'll send I'm, your motion. Okay, yeah. That's great. Okay. <laughs> great. And so we'll reconvene. I'll, I'll do, we'll do do poll. We'll meet sometime in November and um, reach out if you have any questions for, for, for Joe, Emily, or I, or, or Michael, and we can go from there. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you, folks. Have a great evening. Good night. Bye.